when I started uh, my research on language politics and nationalism in Central Europe uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, I, I remember the moment uh, I needed a lot of material which uh, was available across a lot of libraries to which I didn't have money to go across the region from Scandinavia down to Greece and from France uh, to, uh, to, to Russia. So I was lucky I got a fellowship to go to the Library of Congress in Washington because over there you have all the publication of the vast majority of them. So I could access them. Uh, we had a very interesting meeting in the Library of Congress. It was the beginnings of the Internet and there was a discussion what to do about information, how and in which manner and for what purposes it should become more widely available online. And we had several rounds of discussions and we came to such a tentative conclusion at that time because it was a group of scholars and a group of librarians running uh, the uh, Library of Congress, that the Library of Congress is a custodian of world's knowledge, uh, which is kind of stored in the form of these 150 million publications in the library. So these should be digitized and uh, made available in a democratic manner to all scholars around the world. So, in a way, it is happening, including the Library of Congress, which on its website has uh, around uh, 8 million uh, items uh, available free of charge uh, online. So it is uh, the way of the future, I believe. That not the place in which you live was the uh, condition, uh, your, your access uh, to research material. Uh, just to close this introduction, when I finished writing my book uh, uh, around uh, 2007, in which I was researching at the, the Library of Congress, out of sudden the internet was the norm of the day, online access uh, to catalogs and online access uh, to uh, publications. Uh, now probably you cannot imagine that you would be able to do research without uh, uh, such facilities, but it is uh, uh, important to remember it is a very recent development and it should not be taken for granted, so you should watch the space. This atlas, when I proposed uh, creating it, uh, was appreciated, the idea of it was appreciated by British historian Eric uh, Holtzbaum, who hoped uh, that uh, it would be a very useful resource. Uh, I cannot ask him because meanwhile uh, he uh, uh, was, became deceased, uh, so I don't know if it would be fulfilling uh, his hopes for this atlas and the presentation of the issues of language politics and nationalism in modern Central Europe. However, other scholars uh, dealing uh, with these issues, uh, uh, Italian uh, historian Andrea Graziosi of uh, Eastern and Central Europe, of Russian history, Soviet history, and nowadays of Ukrainian history, kind of appreciates uh, this uh, atlas, and also under a sense, uh, uh, she is Professor uh, 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 mm -hmm. Emerita at, uh, at Dublin College, uh, and uh, she specializes in historical uh, cartography. Well, this atlas is, is a recent thing, yeah, so at which I arrived 30 years uh, into mm, uh, my life as a researcher. So there were some books earlier which uh, I wrote, and uh, these books were touching upon the subject from different perspectives, from different angles, but uh, fully in the textual form. And, uh, uh, here you have these books, so this book with 
this uh, kind of Archimbodos uh, picture, which is, which is quite extensive because it's over 1,000 pages, uh, has all these bits and pieces uh, of information about uh, changing language politics uh, in uh, narrowly understood uh, uh, Central Europe, uh, meaning Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary with the, some broader context. But, uh, you know, when I uh, published this book, it, 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 it's probably my most popular book, or my most used book uh, by scholars. Uh, people were asking me, what's the point of this book? Yeah. Because it's, it's a monograph, but as a monograph it's too long to read it in extenso. So most people use it as a kind of encyclopedia, which is fine. I, I didn't know that it would become such a kind of encyclopedia when I started it. But, uh, but it is a lot of a material. So cert certain ideas which are expounded in this book, they are difficult to grasp without reading it in extenso. That's why I uh, started thinking about presenting the material in a cartographic spatial form, because in a way, uh, in the form of a map, uh, on, onto the map you can cram a lot of information uh, which in the textual form in order to explain it you need you know hundreds of pages so after a sudden it is doable not everything is doable in this manner but uh, these pieces of information kind of relate, related to central Europe as a, as a region they can be presented in this manner so, in the middle, it is a shorter book, around 200 pages, uh, and uh, in a way, it is an abbreviation and a rethinking of the main streams of reflection in this big, in this big book. And uh, my uh, most recent book, published two years ago, Politics and the Slavic Language, it is a reflection on how Slavic languages uh, are used for political ends and how political projects uh, produced uh, uh, Slavic languages as we uh, know them. And uh, the starting point of this book was that in the middle of the 19th century there was this uh, school of thought that there is just one Slavic language. Yeah? And, uh, uh, what at the time was seen as Polish, uh, as uh, Czech, Illyrian, today we would say Serbo-Croatia, Russian, they were actually dialects of one Slavic language. And nowadays uh, the number of the Slavic languages is around 40. Uh, these 14 languages uh, which are state languages, which are used in official capacity, and uh, uh, like like uh, Polish, uh, Bosnian, Ukrainian, you name it, and uh, around 30 which are uh, used either in the regional capacity, which are recognized or which are not recognized, you know, like Kashubian recognized, Silesia not recognized. And there was this uh, reflection, which norms, political, scholarly, are being adopted to think about languages like that. You know, and what changed between the 19th century when people were thinking there is just one Slavic language and today when people believe there are 40 Slavic languages. Yeah, so certain political norms, uh, norms of doing research, uh, they change uh, during these 200 years. So it is a kind of a um, intellectual history of concept. So, these strains I tried to incorporate into the atlas and I was thinking how this atlas should be organized. Uh, so, I developed map series uh, of, uh, which are chronological of certain features like uh, dialect continua, like writing systems, and then thematic uh, maps uh, for instance, uh, of universities, uh, 
teaching in languages different than the language of the nation state in which such a, a university is located. Uh, uh, each map is accompanied by a compact uh, uh, explanatory text, uh, which is anything between one and five pages. And uh, the entire atlas is appended with the index of place names and, importantly, uh, with the glossary of uh, key terms and concepts uh, related to Central Europe and language politics in this region. Because we use in our research such concepts as language, nation, nationality, Central Europe, and we believe that we know what we are talking about. But truly speaking, we don't know what we are talking about before we define these concepts. And only then we can use these concepts uh, for focused research and focused uh, discussion, uh, which is clearly communicated to other scholars. That's why this glossary of the Grief Geschichte, you could, you, you could say, and this glossary is quite a substantial part of this atlas, it is like 50,000 pages, yeah? so like a small monograph, you could say. <clears throat> when I research on this atlas, uh, I also discussed the concept uh, with uh, colleagues uh, interested in language pol politics uh, in modern Central Europe. I had the pleasure in uh, 2011 to be at Hokkaido University in the Slavic Eurasian Research Center, which is uh, one of these Cold War time research centers on the Soviet bloc, and they continued out of sudden because of the sudden war in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine, this center and other centers of this type out of sudden are uh, uh, of uh, immediate importance again. But we had the discussion, uh, the colleagues uh, contributed uh, some thoughts in the form of articles, uh, I contributed some sample maps and uh, this kind of book was published, you can access it, it's once again available free, on, uh, free of charge online. Uh, practically all the research publications of the Slavic Research, uh, Slavic Eurasian Research Center at Hokkaido University are in English, some in Russian, uh, and they are available uh, free of charge online. So, uh, now I want to uh, show you how this atlas work, uh, works and how it can be ideally used. So, for instance, uh, it is the atlas of Central Europe. So, ideally you can go to the glossary and see uh, what Central Europe is as a concept employed in this atlas and uh, because it is such a key concept uh, I also give a history of this concept. So for instance uh, what we know nowadays as Central Europe didn't exist uh, at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, in the 18th century there was this uh, great northern war uh, fought out mainly between Sweden and Muscovy and uh, it was fought out uh, mostly on the territory what today is Poland, uh, the Baltic state, Belarus, Ukraine and it is called the Great Northern War. Yeah? So at that time, at, uh, uh, in the 18th century, this part of Europe was part of Northern Europe, not part of Central Europe. The concept of Central Europe appears uh, more or less in the middle of the 19th century and it is being uh, given a firm political lease of life by Friedrich Naumann, uh, a German MP during the First World War when he published his uh, seminal uh, political study, Middle Europa, yeah? Central Europe, and this uh, study as a sketch of the uh, war goals of uh, 
Germany and the Austria-Hungary was published in uh, translations into Central European languages, be it Czech, be it Russian, be it Polish, be it Bulgarian, you name it. So, here there is a map of Central Europe, practically all the maps are of Central Europe and uh, they are of this spatial extent uh, from Scandinavia down to the Balkans and Western Anatolia uh, and uh, from what today is uh, German and Switzerland to what today is the Western uh, reaches uh, of uh, Russia. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about the map series. Yeah? So, uh, the main map series is about dialect continuum. And here we have uh, from the glossary the explanation of what dialect continuum is. Obviously, uh, uh, when you are taught about Central Europe, people talk about uh, East Slavic languages, uh, uh, West Slavic languages, uh, and South Slavic language. Truly speaking, uh, there is no linguistic uh, uh, element for distinguishing between East Slavic languages such as Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, and West Slavic languages such as Polish, uh, Czech, uh, Slovak. So, uh, dialect continuum is uh, uh, the way of looking at languages through the lens of space uh, prior to the codification of uh, languages, prior to uh, compulsory universal education, basically language changes from village to village, from town to town, from region to region, which creates a continuum uh, of gradual change, and this continuum, uh, you know, would start when it comes to the Slavic uh, continuum. There are there are two Slavic uh, dialect continua. Yeah? There is this North Slavic, starting in what today is uh, is uh, Germany, with swords, uh, musicians, if you want, and going on uh, to 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 what today is. Uh, uh, Eastern Russia, yeah, so the Pacific, uh, uh, you could say. Uh, in the space, language uh, prior to the codification was changing gradually, and you could actually understand uh, uh, each uh, different variety of uh, a language. Now, obviously, uh, you are unable to do it because of the education. We have these blocks of languages here. There is Polish, which is spoken the same, written the same, both uh, in Katowice and in Olsztyn. Here there is Czech, which is written and spoken the same, both uh, in Prague and in Brno, and so on and so on. So this type of dialect continuum uh, waned. Although, although, although this dialect continu continu continuum uh, in the case of uh, South Slavic languages still to a degree exists. Okay, so I won't be giving you the entire map, I will be giving you some smaller fragments of map because otherwise the uh, PPT would be too heavy uh, for, uh, for dealing with uh, by the computer. And, uh, 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 this fragment here is uh, of Silesia, so our region in which we are now, and shows you the dialect continuum more or less uh, how it looked like in the 16th uh, century. So green is Slavic, uh, uh, red is uh, Germanic, and uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, lines, uh, you know, hashing ha ha lines, they are showing the diasporic presence of Yiddish-speaking uh, Jews. Okay, 
And uh, such, the series obviously has several maps. I'm not showing you all the maps because if you are interested in this atlas, you can have a look uh, at this atlas itself. Uh, another series uh, concerns writing systems. So, what kind of writing, uh, uh, quote unquote, alphabets we are using? Obviously, alphabet is a kind of a system of writing using letters for denoting vowels and consonants, uh, and there are different ones, but let's not go into it. Uh, that's why I'm using the term uh, writing system, not uh, alphabet, uh, kind of a broader term. And uh, in Central Europe, Central Europe was distinctive vis-à-vis -vis Western Europe uh, and uh, Eastern Europe uh, that until the modern period and even nowadays, you have a multiplicity of writing systems used for noting languages on paper, recording languages on paper here. So nowadays we have the Latin alphabet, the Cyrillic, uh, 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 Cyrillic alphabet, uh, and uh, the Greek uh, alphabet uh, in the case of Greece and Cyprus. But uh, uh, prior uh, to the Second World War, there was also the Arabic script uh, used uh, for uh, writing. There was uh, also the Hebrew for writing, be it Arabic, be it Tur uh, Turkish and also uh, the Hebrew writing system used uh, for writing uh, the Yiddish language, the Hebrew language, and the Ladino language, so kind of Judeo-Spanish Judeo used by uh, Sephardic Jews uh, south of the Danube in the Balkans uh, and in the Ottoman uh, Empire. So, once again, here we have uh, an example of uh, such a map, a fragment of the map of writing system. So more or less it's the same region which uh, I uh, presented uh, on the map of the Dale Continua in the 16th century, but uh, the map is now from the middle of the 18th century. So you have here the uh, Hebrew script, uh, used for writing Yiddish and Hebrew. You have uh, Latin script, this kind of brown, uh, which you can see uh, on the map. You have Cyrillic, which is kind of squeezed in what uh, today is uh, Eastern Slovakia and uh, Western most uh, Ukraine. And you have uh, a subtype uh, of uh, 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 the Latin alphabet, so-called Gothic type fracture or black letters. Here in Silesia it would be called German letters, you know, sometimes it is called like that. <coughs> I also produce a series of maps done in different languages and different scripts to see how, uh, to show how Central Europe looks like to the users of these languages and uh, the scripts. So, uh, Central Europe to a degree from the medieval period uh, until the Holocaust uh, is uh, coterminous or synonymous, you could even say, with Yiddish land. Yeah? So, uh, with uh, Ashkenazi Jews who lived in this region until the Holocaust uh, and who uh, numbered around 12 million people and they were speaking uh, the Yiddish language, which is the language which is the closest uh, to German. So. It is uh, as mutually comprehensive with German as Czech and Slovak. I would risk such a statement, uh, or uh, as Polish and Belarusian, uh, if you want another set of comparison. And this language was written down uh, in Hebrew uh, letters. So, 
Obviously, nowadays, unfortunately, uh, most people do not know how to read uh, Hebrew letters, so obviously giving only the names uh, of uh, different uh, regions, towns and cities and rivers uh, in the Hebrew script of the Yiddish uh, language uh, would be self-defeating, uh, like uh, for instance Krakow is Kroke, most people would not be able to read it, so as a kind of aid I'm giving transliteration using the standard system as developed by Ivo, so Yiddish Scientific Institute established in 1925 in Vilnius, Vilno, and nowadays located in New York. So, out of sudden, it is in a different script, but you can access it, you know, thanks to transliteration. So, I have similar maps, for instance, uh, for Osman Lidze in Ottoman Turkish uh, too, and in Moldovan, based in Cyrillic, with such transliteration. Okay. Uh, the defining part of what became of modern Central Europe is ethno-linguistic nationalism, this concept uh, that uh, people, uh, that, that nation state in this region are created for people speaking the same language and people speaking the same language constitute the nation and people who are of a different language, belong to different nations, so they should either leave, quote unquote, a given nation state or to be assimilated by force. So the 20th century was the period of mass uh, expulsions across Central Europe from the Baltic uh, down to the Mediterranean from what today is Eastern France to what today is Ukraine. So I decided that this story must be taught uh, and the dynamics of these expulsions must be somehow cartographically shown. Because obviously when we have a list of these expulsions, uh, soon enough our mind is numbed and we do not really register what's going on. And we do not see the logic of it in space. So that was the idea of presenting this information in the spatial form of maps. So here you have a map, a fragment of a map of uh, ethnic cleansing expulsions uh, uh, during and in the aftermath uh, of the Great War. And uh, I'm using, as you can see, uh, colors of languages for denoting uh, people of which language were expelled from where. But languages was not enough. Uh, I was also adding uh, the, 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 the symbols for religions and the symbols for script. Yeah. Because, uh, let's put it like this, Yiddish and German are as languages of the same quote-unquote linguistic family are marked uh, in kind of red. So uh, out of sudden the expulsion of this population or extermination of a given population wouldn't make much sense. Yet uh, when you add uh, uh, the symbol of religion and the symbol for the script, uh, uh, the quote-unquote logic, with which I obviously disagree, uh, of such form of ethnic cleansing uh, becomes uh, uh, clear. So, well, <coughs> also was adding how many people were expelled, in which period, and who they were usually from their own perspective or from the perspective of the expelled. Of course, it's in thousands. Yes, yes, obviously, it is in thousands, yeah, so it is. 120,000, 550,000, yeah, thank you for that, yeah, Now, another uh, 
maps yes, uh, we, of linguistic areas, uh, uh, which is some, which is which is which is a concept not very well known outside social linguistics, but sometimes uh, you are surprised that you have the same word uh, in, 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 in Polish, in German, for instance, uh, politik, politika. Yeah. Obviously, it is a Greek loan word. Yeah. So, uh, scholars doing research uh, in this region were drawing uh, for, uh, they were drawing at writings in Latin and in Greek uh, to develop vocabularies for chemistry, for mechanics, uh, and so on. So, people speaking different languages, uh, quote unquote, genetically different, Germanic and Slavic, they were drawing at similar concept, at similar ideas, and they were borrowing these concepts and words, which led to the closeness between uh, the languages, mm -hmm. uh, despite uh, the quote-unquote genetic difference uh, uh, between them. So. The, the first linguistic area of this type uh, was uh, mm, distinguished in the Balkans uh, because uh, what we see today as the Balkans was contained in the Roman Empire and in the Ottoman Empire for over 2,000 years. So uh, Bartholomeus Kopitar who was a censor in Austria-Hungary of books in different languages, and uh, ethnically he was of Slovenian uh, descent. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, he proposed uh, that uh, Bulgarian, Romanian, Greek uh, are the same language or the same grammar in which only words are changed. Yeah? Like you have the uh, definite article in Greek and you have the definite article in Bulgarian, which is kind of flabbergasting, you know, because in Polish there are no definite and indefinite uh, articles. Yet in Bulgarian, through these exchanges uh, within this linguistic idea within this political quote-unquote container of the Roman Empire and then the Ottoman Empire, such influences made the languages close to one another. And uh, uh, another thing uh, is something which Mystifyingly, probably, I'm calling the normative isomorphism of language, uh, nation, and state. It is uh, kind of a technical definition which uh, I developed uh, for distinguishing what we usually refer to as uh, ethnic nationalists or ethnic linguistic nationalists. We have this kind of intuition that languages define nations uh, and uh, for such linguistic nations uh, nation states should be built in Central Europe especially after the uh, First World War. But, but usually in, in, in uh, words on uh, nationalists you don't get definition what the whole thing is about. Yeah? So I was kind of uh, thinking about the problem of uh, definition and I decided that probably instead of looking for some definition I, I should have a uh, look at the practices of creating uh, nations based uh, on language and uh, on creating states uh, steeped in this ideology. So 
I came with this idea that basically uh, first framers of a nation decide where, uh, what a given language is. Yeah? So they decide whether it is Czech or Czechoslovak, whether it is Serbian or Serbo-Croatian. Yeah? Then they decide and these decisions, uh, to a degree, are arbitrary. You know? So they not only decide, they also create uh, the concepts uh, and ideas uh, are accepted uh, within the realm of politics. <coughs> so wherever, uh, this, uh, then they decide uh, through censuses uh, where speakers of a given language live, and uh, they draw a map of the contiguous territory or territories and they then postulate that uh, speakers of language X living in such territory X uh, should be overhauled on this territory into a nation state X. And obviously uh, crucial for this entire process were censuses and in 1872 uh, states which were running censuses in Europe they agreed uh, at the 6th International Statistic Congress of Statistics in St. Petersburg that the question about language as a measure of nationality should be included in all the censuses in quote-unquote civilized states. Yeah. That's the language of the day. So, why isomorphism? Isomorphism, uh, those of you who know physics, it is a term from physics, which uh, denotes full overlapping of certain uh, items. Yeah? So here you have full spatial overlapping of uh, language, population speaking this language, nation if you want, and the territory of a given state. That's why, probably, if you traveled a bit uh, in Western Europe or in the United States, you've noticed that uh, across Central Europe uh, there is the atlas of history used as a specific kind of a textbook. Such textbook uh, uh, is not used in Western Europe or, or, or you know, in the United States. Why? Because this is a very counterintuitive idea and very difficult to visualize and to grasp yeah? that there is such a thing like a language, there are, uh, there are people who speak this language and they constitute one organism, quote unquote, a nation, and then for these people uh, a nation state should be created. So there is uh, the series of maps showing uh, through historical analysis uh, when in a given period uh, uh, a given nation state in Central Europe it's, it's basically you know, the period uh, beginning uh, in the late 19th century until today which uh, nation state fulfills this idea of normative uh, isomorphism. I won't be going into detail, obviously, if you are interested, uh, you can refer to the map. But one of the main conclusions uh, of my atlas is that actually Central Europe, as we know it today, can be defined through uh, this normative isomorphism. Because uh, uh, you could say that states uh, aspiring or having fulfilled the normative isomorphism uh, define where Central Europe is. And from this perspective, Central Europe is, extends from what today is Scandinavia down to what today is the Balkans and Turkey, and from Germany down to Ukraine and, uh, and the Baltic uh, states. Obviously, I had to take uh, a cut-off date uh, for my atlas. I took the date uh, when I stopped gathering the material, 2009. But, you know, history or 
developments uh, in human societies never stop as long as these human societies exist and uh, now there is this uh, tragic uh, uh, and unjustified uh, war which Russia wages uh, on Ukraine and if you look at uh, quote unquote uh, the, 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 the justifications used by the Kremlin for waging this war they propose out of sudden that uh, all the speakers uh, of the Russian language, <coughs> irrespective of where they live, they are members uh, of the Russian nation and they should be loyal to Russia. Uh, so, uh, beginning in 2014 with the seizure of Crimea, Russia grabbed ethno-linguistic nationalism as another instrument of uh, Russian neo imperialism which is a very interesting methodological development. Obviously, uh, it is a very sad development for people who are impacted uh, uh, by these tragic events. Uh, uh, yet, out of sudden, this concept of the normative isomorphism, if applied nowadays, would, uh, would include Russia. Now, well, what does it mean? Uh, from the perspective of research, I don't know. I would need basically to look deeper uh, into it. But you see, research never stops. Uh, developments on the ground still continue. Well, I have another uh, uh, map, which is, which is uh, more of a thematic map, not as a map series, Romanistan, yeah. uh, which, uh, which, uh, which is uh, a kind of a calc of Yiddish land uh, because uh, the majority of the words Roma are concentrated uh, in uh, Central Europe. Uh, I wanted uh, to create a map uh, of Central Europe in which I would give all the names of the regions and uh, towns uh, in the Romani language, in the language of the Roma or so-called Gypsies, which is kind of a contentious term. Uh, but soon I found out, because there is no single standard of the uh, Romani language, and because uh, Romani uh, is not used as a language of education anywhere across the region, ir irrespective of the fact that in today's Europe, uh, Roma are the largest stateless uh, minority numbering around 12 million people, so as many as Ashkenazic Jews, Yiddish-speaking Jews, before the war. So, symmetries uh, are pretty striking here. So, I didn't know how to develop this map, but uh, I was advised at colleagues at, at St. Andrews who are specializing in Romani studies, basically, to present uh, localities uh, with the concentrations uh, of Roma in today's Central Europe and within these localities are marking whether they are using Romani as the language of everyday communication within this locality or another language or several uh, languages. Uh, obviously these are not all the localities where Roma live, they are kind of the largest or the best known, so it is a selection of these uh, uh, localities. Uh, we've identified uh, quite quite a few of them, so uh, it is a map composed from two maps, actually. Well, you have here, once again, the mentioning of uh, the glossary and language politics, meaning uh, polit language used for political ends, uh, and uh, if you can read, uh, uh, I created uh, a kind of uh, tentative map of Central Europe in the Silesian language, which is difficult to do, yeah? because if you are doing something for the first time and the Silesian language has started to be codified only 10 years ago, there, is, there are still disagreements uh, which is an appropriate name of Hungary or the Czech Republic. So basically I drew at the ideas of Mr. Andrzej Rocznik, who was uh, the first publisher of uh, Silesian language books. Uh, 
and to compose a map of Central Europe in, 20, in, in 2009 with the use of this language. Now, we live in a very strange part of the world. Obviously, this part of the world in which we live is normal to us because we were born here, we were raised here, we were educated here, but uh, then when we go to school and start learning out of sudden, we are primed for surprises, yeah? Because, well, you are from Poland, so you speak Polish. Yeah? Okay. People from the Czech Republic speak Czech, no nothing. People from Slovakia speak, speak Slovak, no nothing. Yeah, so people from Brazil speak Brazilian, from Argentina, Argentina. Not really, yeah? So, there is this moment of surprise. What do I refer to? I refer to ethno-linguistic nationalism. Ethno-linguistic nationalism as a state forming, state uh, legitimizing ideology is used only in Central Europe. Only in Central Europe you have states which are coterminous with their own specific languages, languages which are also used for defining nations living in these nation states across Central Europe. And the cluster of uh, ethno-linguistic nation states which fulfill the constraints of the normative isomorphies of language, nation, and state, this cluster emerged in, uh, of the states uh, emerged after the First World War. So, after having finished research on these issues of language politics and nationalism across Central Europe and having identified uh, through the definition of the normative isomorphy this cluster uh, of uh, uh, ethno-linguistic nation-states and the dynamics of the formation uh, mainly during the uh, 20th century, I asked myself questions. Can we find ethno-linguistic nation-states anywhere else in the world? And I found such arena in Southeast Asia. And uh, including Japan. And uh, Japan is easy to explain because in the process of modernization uh, in, the, in the 1870s, the entire government of Japan was shipped. And they traveled around the world for almost two years, uh, going to all the quote-unquote civilized states to try to find a model of statehood which would be most appropriate for Meiji Japan. And they decided that the model they found in the German nation state should be implemented uh, in Japan. And in uh, 1889, when the Imperial Meiji Constitution was adopted, this model was adopted in Japan. Okay, so we have these two clusters, Central European one of nations, uh, Earth and US nation states, and Southeast Asian one. I asked myself a question. When the other one, the Asian one, cluster emerged? And it emerged in the, in the course of the colonization, so after the Second World War. Now, the question is whether this idea of ethno-linguistic nationalism as the ideology for creating uh, nation states and defining ethno-linguistic ethno nations uh, uh, was somehow exported to uh, Southeast Asia or somehow imported by activists in Southeast Asia? I don't know, truly speaking. Yeah. Uh, my hypothesis is that most probably it was the case of copying. Yeah. Uh, in the case of Japan, it's easily visible. Then, Japan in the interwar period was one of the centers 
uh, of uh, decolonization activism for Asian uh, politicians, students uh, from what today is Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, they were going to Japan to learn how to build a non-European, non-Western modern state. Another channel of the spread of the idea of ethnolinguistic communism, uh, sorry, ethnolinguistic nationalism is the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union was practicing ethnolinguistic nationalism uh, as a form of administrative division of this country. And communism, uh, all the countries uh, which you can hear, which you can see here, apart from Japan uh, and, uh, and Thailand, uh, and to a degree uh, Burma, they were or still are, uh, are uh, communist countries. Yeah. So, it is a subject for you to research if you are interested, if I may say so. <coughs> here, I give you, you know, kind of the beginning uh, of the index, if you, are inter if you are interested in, basically, I gather all the linguistic versions of place names used uh, on the maps of this atlas, I never thought it would be so complicated, yeah. but, but, but we did it. it. Probably it was the most labor-intensive part of this uh, atlas as a uh, uh, book. That's it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, and obviously you can ask in Polish if you have difficulties to formulate your questions.